Okay, we're going to look at an essay on the Jewish role in the Holocaust. And this essay is written by a student named Sam Kay. Um, I'm not really familiar with this particular individual, but anyways, having read this uh, this excerpt, it's a pretty good example of what the um, exam boards are looking for to get in the sort of the top band of marks. What you have to do, and what he does initially off the bat here, is he shows that um, you need to look at the answer or bit by bit, look at how the, uh, the historian wrote it, approached the evidence, what she says about the evidence, and then how that evidence can be supported or contradicted by other historians. Now, <laughs> from the beginning of this extract, he talks about the first thing he talks about, okay? Uh, the fact that um, had the Jews not been able to participate in the Holocaust, it would have led to a severe drain in manpower. Now, this is really the basis of her first paragraph, okay? That effectively the Jews were an absolute necessity in their own destruction here um, because of, uh, um, yeah, because of the, the fact that they contributed. Now, um, <clears throat> here we have, uh, if we go down to the bottom of this paragraph, Sam in this particular essay starting to contradict it uh, with what other historians said. So she directly talks about the evidence presented to make that point and then says, however, um, here the historian fails to pay attention to the willingness of collaborators and how the actions they took, which were not in line with the Nazis' wishes, would prevent them from having power at all. Okay, despite the lack of formal rules. Um, for example, he notes historian James Glass says that uh, resistance should be heavily commended because of the severe circumstances that they um, that if they failed, it became clear that they weren't collaborating um, uh, officially. So make a long story short, you have, even though there's a, a couple of uh, uh, spelling mistakes is relatively irrelevant in this particular point. You have, this is what she says, this is how she says it, and this is what um, other people have said about her. Then he moves on to that second paragraph, which is a really the key one in here. Uh, secondly, the historian goes on to use evidence of Jewish compliance and, uh, and Jewish autonomy to argue uh, that um, the Holocaust on some, uh, on some kind of way was, po was only possible because of that. Now, um, this here um, is the real key to the historian's argument. Now, um, the argument here challenges the ideas that the Jews needed to comply and raises questions if they were willing executioners, which sort of aligns with Goldhagen. Um, the you got to be a little bit <coughs> careful here, uh, and one of the things I'll, I'll point out is the fact that Goldhagen really argues on the other uh, controversy, the idea that um, uh, the Jews weren't weren't intent on destroying themselves. The fact that they complicit they were complicit in this particular uh, in this particular event and the or the, in the Holocaust doesn't necessarily mean that like the the Germans would put into the particular place they became their own they became willing killers or willing uh, subjects of mass extermination. But they in some cases, as Goldhagen said, because of latent anti-Semitism. The, the Jews enjoyed their work. Now, that, that's not necessarily true in this circumstance, and this is one little error in this essay, is that you've got to be a little bit careful about getting into the Goldhagen stuff, because Goldhagen at any time doesn't say that the Jews were anti-Semitic against themselves. So th there's a little bit of a, a problem here, and I would probably knock you down a, a point or two, but it doesn't really hurt the overall point you're trying to make. Um, Additionally, okay, um, he goes, if again, following in the third paragraph, the historian moderates his or her views, again, showing it a, deep, uh, a, uh, a really adept understanding of the approach of the historian and what, what they're trying to say by saying that the Jews were subconsciously contributing to the Nazi implementation for the Holocaust. For example, the Jews um, who tried not to tell people of their imminent death so that their remaining time was more enjoyable or bearable, I guess is the is the term that he actually uses. This consequently contributed to the Holocaust because the people were more willing to listen to Nazi orders. In some cases, they volunteered for the deportations to places like Auschwitz. The, um, this is effectively the argument that they're making here. So it's not that the Jews wanted to destroy themselves. It's the fact that they were doing it to make things more bearable. And against it's a sense of moderation. Um, of course, 
Uh, here we have something that's co corroborated by other historians, uh, again, to showing that and placing this very well within the historical context, okay? Because Friedman argues that um, uh, the pseudo saviors of the Holocaust contributed to its uh, perpetration, okay? Um, unconscious or in a conscious way. And that's a really good example of people who tend to agree with this uh, excerpt that comes from Hannah Arnett. The historian here, um, does not know, which is the subject of this third paragraph, which is a very good counter paragraph about all of the things that are interesting that this approach does not allow the historian to say, okay, what things she doesn't consider, what evidence she leaves out in this particular point. He brings up the, um, the example of um, Chaim Rambowski, who had a significant power in um, disposing currency, and Leo Bach, who tried to help by creating a Jewish police. Um, these are examples. Um, these are examples um, of of other people who who also helped the Nazis. But the, however, the he goes on to say the author therefore summarizes the argument by noting the distinguishing factors between the uh, uh, the kind of collaboration. Um, this responsibility of the groups as a whole for not resisting authority because of their ability to drain German manpower. Okay, the uh, this, this is sort of their um, um, uh, a sort of a counter argument within that. Okay. Also, he argues that the historian fails to note the active resistance of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. It's, it's important to put into context and show that you understand historically what types of things that their um, the historians are leaving out. There's no talk here about the Warsaw Ghetto. There's no talk about the Sea from Sylvie Boer. There's no talk about the destruction of German goods that they were manufacturing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, moreover, here he goes on to say that the historian does not assess the smaller individual actions of the Jews who were persecuted and, oh, um, and only looks at the main collaborators. For example, the, it doesn't consider the willingness of the Jews to um, walk to the gas chambers or the willingness of some Jews um, to sort of fight for their own lives uh, above or beyond uh, above or at the expense of others. So what I say here in my in my comments is here, here Sam, you have a good analysis of the approach. Um, in contrast, uh, you could also develop this with um, more comparative historians. So though th this is good pointing out the evidence he doesn't have, there are lots of historians who argue a very, very, very vocal case for the Jews. So bottom line here is you, there are is a little bit, uh, well, a little bit, if you look at Lesson 14, there's an incredible amount of context, actually rather Lesson 12, there's incredible amount more of context you can put in here to really show off that you understand um, exactly what the counter argument to what's being portrayed in this small excerpt actually is. What's more, what I think really needs to be done here, um, apart from just adding a little bit more detail, is you have to try and put this in context. Now, as you note, and as Lesson 12 takes you in a chronological order, the people who came out and started to blame the Jews for their own destruction were really the early historians who were writing. And most of this, the writing that blamed the Jews for their own destruction um, came out of people like Hannah Arnett and Ralph Hilberg, who wrote in the 1960s. And since that particular point, because of a lot of, in a lot of cases, geopolitical changes, particularly and most acutely the falling of the Berlin Wall, which allowed historians from the West to access the archives in the East where the majority of the Holocaust was perpetrated, we can actually learn now that there was significantly more um, uh, resistance that we first knew. Now, let's just put it in perspective. Think of your, your ability to go to Auschwitz today. In 1989, that wasn't even possible until the, Poland left the communist bloc. Um, the places where the Holocaust was perpetrated were completely inaccessible to people um, that were, of course, outside of Eastern Europe. But of course, in a highly controlled communist state, these places weren't necessarily even accessible to them. Now, make a long story short, what we see here um, is from the late 1980s onwards, people with access to more information, people are able to visit these sites, people are able to get a hold of the witnesses who are trapped behind the Iron Curtain, are finding out that there's a lot more. And what it's important to do in both excerpts of this is try and place this excerpt in the sort of area um, uh, in the time it was written. Now, what you'll know for both of the controversies that we look at in this particular course is that the controversies around these subjects evolve greatly, 
okay? They start with one central idea, that idea is usually revised, and then some sort of consensus is reached on the other hand. And now, there's a lot of people who will say that Arnett, perhaps, and, and she is the author of this particular source, is partially right, that there was, yes, complicity, and that did, of course, um, help the Germans to a certain degree, whether consciously or unconsciously they were trying to help the Germans or whether they were trying to make life more bearable for those who were still, um, you know, who are about to die, the reasons are, are many and varied. But what you have to understand is that historians have concluded that, in fact, it wasn't just blind obedience, that perhaps Hannah Arnett's um, uh, claim in this particular excerpt that the destruction of their own people is undoubtedly the darkest chapter in the whole dark story isn't necessarily the case at all. In fact, the story is much more complex and that the Jews did resist and they weren't willing um, to comply on their own destruction. Now, what is really important here, and what I think this excerpt does well, is it gets away, for the most part, anyhow, um, and it's when he does bring it in Goldhagen, it doesn't actually hurt the overall point, that the approach and the interpretation in this excerpt um, are um, not to do with the sort of the who made the decision for the Holocaust. This is the the, the Jews. And what, what I think here um, we have in this last um, paragraph here is, aside from trying to place this in the context of when it was written, it does, relatively speaking, um, um, sort of sum up the approach and the interpretation of the author, which I think is outlined pretty pretty well by following bit by bit with some contrasting evidence and certainly placing it well within the historical context. Um, a, an excerpt here that would probably yield a top level mark, perhaps on the bottom end for the reasons I described, and perhaps for the la little bit of lack of detail in this last little bit, but generally speaking, Sam, this particular essay did quite a decent job. So we have um, AO2, which is your overall assessment mark. This is your ability to analyze how well do you understand the interpretation and the approach. I think Sam does understand the interpretation of the approach. There are some areas in which he could have built on, and therefore he gets 16 out of 20. And AO1, the knowledge is often tied to that, and because he um, is quite knowledgeable in this particular point, um, however, does leave some on the table, I think he's in the lower of the top end. And we see a mark that yields 16 out of 20, 16 out of 20, totaling 30. Um, uh, 2 out of 40, um, which is actually the mark you should have got. So as we've proved, <laughs> Mr. Rain, um, is many things, and not a mathematician, actually, so um, my bad on that, but yeah, good job, Sam. 32 out of 40 is a good, is a very good mark, and it would yield you an A or a star, depending on the bell curve, so good job.